Good afternoon. My name is Joe Lawson. I'm the Deputy Director of the Harris County Law Library. It is my absolute privilege today to welcome you to this program. It's a special continuing legal education event from the office of Vince Ryan, Harris County Attorney, as well as the Law Library. Uh, we always love to bring in the author of a book on a topic that is um, you know, in the public conscience right now, and so uh, we are happy to do that today. She is the author of this book, A Citizen's Guide to Impeachment, uh, which is a nonpartisan guide uh, to a precise understanding of the rules and history of impeachment. And so without further ado, I will uh, hand the podium to Barbara Radnofsky. Well, it's, uh, it couldn't be more timely. Today, a 628-page report was issued by the House Judiciary Committee talking about the application of impeachment law uh, to the current facts of the current impeachment, which occurred very recently. There's 19 impeachments in U.S. history where uh, the case made its way all the way to the Senate. 16 of those uh, resulted in verdicts. Three of them caused resignations or other strange things. But there's 19 impeachments in U.S. history, and we are in the midst of what may be the 20th impeachment. We are in historical times. The first impeachment was of a revolutionary era war dodging, securities peddling, swindling, land charlatan. That is the Blount impeachment. It's the first impeachment conviction in history. It's first impeachment in history. It was done while the founders were alive, and the procedures are confusing, but what's significant about the Blount impeachment is the Senate decided how to handle it, but only after the House figured out what the procedures were that they wanted to use. And it is significant for the fact that the House held on to the impeachment for six months while they drafted articles, but the Senate went ahead and had a trial. And the Senate had a trial, but it was a Senate-like trial, and they kicked him out on their own authority as the Senate. The senators actually served as witnesses to the handwriting of Blount. So it was a trial in the best way they could do, and they're struggling with what impeachment meant. Uh, it was a U.S. senator, uh, and the Senate decided with motions to dismiss that either, and it's not clear which one they went on, either a senator could be not impeached, couldn't be impeached, or he was already kicked out. So we, we, you had two trials all six months apart. The first trial was we kick him out. The second trial, when they finally got the impeachment articles, was we can't decide, but on motion, we're going to dismiss the case. Two trials, six months apart, and the impeachment articles occurred in between. So the Blount case is a confusing case. The first impeachment conviction in history also occurred while the Founding Fathers was alive, were alive. The second impeachment is the first impeachment conviction. And that second impeachment is the one I wanted to talk to you about. First one is strange. The second impeachment is straightforward. It was a federal judge who had grown insane. He was senile and insane by the terms of the day. And he had deprived the litigants in his court of a fair trial. He refused to give them, refused to give them uh, the opportunity to cross-examine. He refused to allow them to appeal. And he had been, although appointed by General Washington after he became president, uh, was no longer the beloved judge he'd been. So the second impeachment case in history, which is the first conviction, because the first one is all messed up, but the second case involving Pickering is a federal judge who was incapacitated. He was incapable of forming intent. And the Senate, during the trial, realized he was a danger to the country, and they convicted him. I spent a lot of time on these first two cases. 
And I've got to say that we have to understand that this first conviction is important. Rehnquist, former Chief Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist, wrote extensively on impeachment. And Rehnquist said that the impeachment cases that he examined in his book were as significant and as significant as the most important cases involving judicial matters uh, in the history of the country. The last impeachment conviction, I'm not going to go through all 19, I promise, but the last of the eight impeachment convictions in the history of this country occurred in the 21st century, and it was prosecuted by Adam Schiff, and it was a federal judge, and the federal judge was as corrupt as you could imagine. There was no question of significant intent to cover up his bribes and misconduct as a state court judge, which he lied about in the nomination process to the FBI. He was proven to have lied, to have affected witnesses, and he was impeached, and he was convicted. That is a case of clear corruption. It was pled as high crimes and misdemeanors. And high crimes and misdemeanors, the criteria for impeachment, is the only way that all 19 impeachments were pled. There have been impeachments of scoundrels. There have been impeachments of land swindlers. There have been impeachments of insane judges. And insane is the parlance of the 19th century that was used with regard to Pickering in the early 1800s, while the founders were alive. This is all a very long introduction to tell you that no intent is required to impeach. It requires neither a crime nor a misdemeanor as we know it today. The term high crimes and misdemeanors is a term of art. And are there, are there non-lawyers in the audience? It's a term of art, it is a specialized term, and it doesn't mean what each of the words say as we know it now. It's not a crime or a misdemeanor. It can certainly be. And the House can undertake to prove a crime, as it appears they may in uh, the, the current case pending. It is unclear. This 628-page document that I have to admit I did not read the entirety of today appears, appears to uh, want to prove up bribery, or at least say that we are going to undertake to prove up bribery. That's plowing new ground. When a Secretary of War, Belknap, under President Grant, was impeached, Belknap clearly took bribes. He used cutouts to do it, but he took bribes and sold the rights to a very valuable trading post to, a, to the guy who bribed him. He resigned right before the House, right before he was going to be convicted in the Senate. Uh, and the Senate couldn't decide what to do uh, because, again, it's one of those confused impeachments. But we know he was impeached, and we know he was fixing to be convicted. That was not charged as bribery. The word bribery appears in some of the allegations, but the charge against him was high crimes and misdemeanors. And the reason is high crimes and misdemeanors requires no proof of intent or scienter or mens rea. No culpable mental state is required. And so when you have securities peddlers, people who have avoided their responsibilities, people who have fomented war to drive settlers to their land, Senator Blount, it's not charged as a treason. It's charged as a high crime or a high misdemeanor, uh, it, or using that term of art. There was, in the Civil War, a desire by Lincoln to make a federal appointment of, a, of, a, of an important post as the war was ending. And he found that a, Senate, a, a judge named West Humphreys was waging war against the United States from his federal bench. The judge had accepted an appointment from the Confederacy as a Confederate judge, and he was seizing property, 
he was imprisoning uh, Union Union uh, soldiers. Uh, he was. He was acting against the interests of the United States in a most treasonous manner. That was pled as a high misdemeanor. The terms of art, high crimes, high misdemeanors, or high crimes and misdemeanors, is not one that requires commission of a crime. It requires harm to the country. That's what impeachment's all about. The, the most exciting part of doing the research for the book was putting together all these 19 cases and realizing that in addition to the 19 cases, there's been many, many investigations into impeachment. Uh, Sp Spiro Agnew uh, asked to be investigated for impeachment. Vice presidents are impeachable. Ambassadors have been investigated for impeachment. Any high officer not defined in the Constitution may be impeached. But it's bookended. The 19 that we have, especially the convictions, they're bookended by this notion that the first impeachment conviction in history was of an incapacitated man. And the last impeachment conviction we've had in history of Judge Porteous was of a completely, dominantly corrupt person who extended his pattern of conduct of just frank corruption and bribery all through his state court life as a judge, his nomination process, and through his service as a federal judge. Incapacity and corruption are both impeachable. And why do I just get so excited about it that I get even some of the first impeachments mixed up? I get so excited about it because Madison, James Madison, a future president, so responsible for the wording of the Federalist Papers and several of the essays there, was the debater at the final debate in the Constitutional Convention about what language should be inserted now that the framers of the Constitution had decided to put impeachment into the U.S. Constitution. And what he worried about was that the Constitution had narrowly defined treason and it had abandoned the notion of an ex post facto law as they had in England, where the king could basically say, I've decided after the fact that you're guilty, and I've decided that it's treachery, it's treason. The founding fathers didn't want that, and so they had a narrow definition of treason, very narrow, and it had a rule of evidence. It's the only rule of evidence I know that there's in the Constitution. You have to have two witnesses, or you have to have an open confession in court. Uh, Treason is really difficult to prove is constitutional treason. So as Madison is debating Mason in the final debates, it's the most exciting debate imaginable. I told the publisher this when the editor said, uh, ditch that debate, you can't even understand the wording of it. And I said, no, it's the most exciting debate in history. And they said, no, it's not. It's really not. You can hardly read it. But it's, it really is. And what Madison says, and there's an Appendix A to your memo there, because what Madison says in the first debates in Congress later, and what he said throughout his long life, he was the oldest uh, survivor of the constitutional signers. Uh, he, he lasted the longest. He initially said and kept to it through his entire life, negligence is impeachable. Incapacity is impeachable. And he gave a long list of other grounds of impeachment. This is the guy who won the final debate in the Constitutional Convention debates about adding the words high crimes and misdemeanors. And Madison said, of all the things that he worried about that would be fatal to our democracy, one would be incapacity and the other would be betrayal of trust, corruption. It's an amazing historical postscript to Madison's life that after having observed during his lifetime the first impeachment conviction of someone who was incapacitated, that here in the 21st century, the last impeachment conviction we've got is somebody who was clearly corrupt. Madison also says something very important, and that is, he, that is although he was looking for patterns of, of misconduct and worried about the, the, a man who would betray his trust at one point, would also betray his trust forever and in the future and could not be trusted, especially when it involved a foreign power. But Madison was adamant that it need not require mens rea, it need not require 
that intent. But he also said a single act could be impeachable. And he was asked when he and Mason, the final two debaters, by the way, George Mason, went on the road to persuade people to adopt the Constitution in the Virginia ratifying convention uh, as they went to try to persuade the delegates to vote for the Constitution. Mason and he had a, a, a dialogue where Mason asks that he or mentions, I worry about the president uh, that we've created in the Constitution uh, pardoning himself. And Madison absolutely replied clearly that there is no protection for such a president. He said, if the president shields himself with any person, suspicious persons is, was his word, uh, and he's talking about the using the pardon power to shield anyone, not just himself, he shall be impeached. And if he's found guilty of doing those acts, he shall be convicted and removed. So Madison really is an important debater who is not well understood. Uh, you see lots of different quotes from different folks, and I've put those, uh, some of the highlights for you in the memo. But Madison really is uh, an exciting presence in the impeachment debates. And in the first Congress, because Madison served not only as president and secretary of state, before that, he was the, in the first Congress. And before that, of course, he was a key constitutional debater and signer. Uh, Madison uh, analyzed these issues and said in the first Congress, when they were creating the Foreign Services Department, which became the State Department. Madison, in debate, had argued that the president should have broad powers, including the power of removal. And it's at the president's uh, discretion to remove an executive officer. That became the issue, by the way, under the Tenure of Office Act, about whether or not Andrew Johnson uh, would be permitted to uh, just uh, remove who he wanted or whether or not a statute could prevent him, whether Congress could prevent him from removing uh, Lincoln's cabinet, especially Secretary of War. That was also the issue that William Howard Taft addressed in the 1920s in an important decision called Myers, which ultimately <coughs> vindicated the result in the Andrew Johnson impeachment, because Taft a long time later, 1926, I think, in the Myers case, says, absolutely, it is the presidential removal power that was cemented in place by James Madison in that first Congress. And the deliberations of the first Congress on the removal power and on everything should be given special weight, in part because so many members of the Constitutional Convention also served in the first Congress. Now, why do I give you that whole history? Because the issue of the first removal also involved, the issue of the first use of the removal power was the president strong enough where we're going to give him enough power to remove anybody without the advice and consent of the Senate. Was the president that powerful? And Madison said, absolutely. I think he foresaw he might want to be doing those kinds of powers because he became president. But he also said, abuse of the removal power is impeachable. And he strongly urged that the, that the impeachment power was the counterweight to broad presidential power. And that's why we have so many great quotes from Madison. Because Madison is a breathing human being who's saying the most exciting things in the world. You can tell he's an old-fashioned tort lawyer. He talks about agency theory. He talks about vicarious responsibility. He doesn't use those exact words. And he talks about direct responsibility. Madison is talking about the liability of the president impeachment on traditional agency theories. And for the non-lawyers, it just means you as the boss are responsible for your negligent selection, retention, training of the people underneath you. And that is a direct responsibility. But you are also responsible for the misconduct of your agents. Two different concepts, direct responsibility and vicarious responsibility. And Madison isn't the only one talking about them, but he's talking about them as, as well as some of the other great speakers at the, at the Constitutional Convention. There's one other historic figure I want to tell you about to, to give you an idea of the scope. 
His name is Wilson, James Wilson. James Wilson was the trifecta, signed the Declaration of Independence, signed the Constitution, served as a Supreme Court Justice. He served as a law professor after that for the rest of his life, and he wrote extensively, including on impeachment. He, too, strongly understood the responsibility of the president under the removal power, that it was, that it was balanced with the fact he could be impeached for the wrongs of his agents and for his direct responsibility for firing those who should not be fired. Why do I emphasize it? Because since 1974, we have had great guidance on what are the duties of a president. And in 1974, and you'll see frequently cited uh, Watergate era uh, research and law, especially put out by the bipartisan committee of Congress, uh, their staff. And they analyzed all impeachments before them, and they said there's, and they, they focused on presidential impeachments. They used judicial impeachments very much the way the Clinton impeachment used judicial impeachments to impeach President Clinton. They are precedent, they give us an idea of what the founders wanted, and they show how it's actually worked in practice. And it is now pretty much, I can't imagine it's, it's questioned law on impeachment, that there are three duties of the president. And the presidential duties that are described, and you'll see them in the table of contents of what I've given you, as well as in certain detail, derive from only two things. And they're both in the Constitution. The duty is from his oath and from what's called the take care clause. That's it. And they're short, they are short phrases. Under the oath, he has two responsibilities. One is to preserve, protect, and defend. And the second is to faithfully execute the office. And I, if, if there's one thing you take away from this speech other than harm is key, it is that the president has the duty to take care that the office be faithfully executed. And it, the, the breach of that duty makes him subject to impeachment. The third duty, by the way, under the take care clause is very broad, and that is he shall take care that the law be faithfully, the laws be faithfully executed. And those three duties appear in the Nixon impeachment language, they are throughout the Clinton impeachment language, and although there was much debate about what would appear, there's no question. They are in the, in the Trump impeachment language, they're there front and center in the Trump impeachment language. And yet, these broad duties are followed by fairly narrow language, according, if you listen to the commentators, about what's being urged in the Trump impeachment. As if there is something different about how this impeachment is being pled than others. And the point of the article is to show you, by showing how consistent the current impeachment articles are with the rest, that it is traditionally pled. It is a traditionally pled impeachment. And it is undertaking a higher burden than the law requires, the law of impeachment, but it is undertaking that burden. And the way it's doing it is interesting. And it may be changed. The whole House can modify it how they want. And it can, by the way, in the Senate, be modified as well. You can make a motion to amend your pleadings, and the Senate would consider it. What it does is try to establish a pattern of activity. And the reason that's in the hearts and minds of the people who pled it, I probably would be speculating and won't do so. But I know what the effect of it is. The effect is it enhances the harm. And maybe Maybe tort lawyers and criminal lawyers and contract lawyers who urge breach and at times need to show intentional breach. When you analyze somebody's motives and you're looking for direct or indirect evidence, one of the things you do is try to establish a pattern of behavior. And the pattern of behavior is broadly pled in this, in this latest impeachment. It is indeed, frankly, more broadly pled than in the Clinton or in the uh, 
Nixon impeachment language. Nixon, of course, is not an impeachment. Nixon is a well-pled, very thought-out set of articles, but they are they caused the resignation of the president once the House Judiciary Committee adopted them uh, with changes because they left off some that they didn't want to, they left off one they didn't want. Uh, I go through all of that to, and I start with the Founding Fathers and, and really want to end the Founding Fathers and open it up for questions. The, the founders and framers viewed the use of impeachment as something of, of a regular process. I don't mean use it every day. I mean a process that was not irregular. It was not non-constitutional. It was a constitutional process. And they urged that if they did not adopt it, and this was highly debated in the Constitutional Convention, whether they should add impeachment because they recognized that people would urge later, you're reversing an election. And they did not want to, they did not want to take away this great experiment in democracy, but they recognized that the people they were given this power to were directly elected House, very direct, directed, and a Senate would try the case. The House alleges and the Senate tries the case. The Senate was viewed as the more deliberative body that would take time to work it out. And so there's a quote early on in the book, perhaps on the first page, uh, around the, the footnote two. I mean, it's very early in the book. And it talks about what Governor Edmund Randolph had to say, he, he of the Virginia delegation. You, you think about these, these icons of history, um, including Mason and Madison. Uh, but they were there urging this massive change. They were revolutionaries turned statesmen. And here is a revolutionary set of people saying, if we don't have a regular punishment, and the only punishment from impeachment is removal from office, and if a second vote is taken, a future federal office holding is barred. If we don't have a regular process, we'll be faced with the alternative of tumult and insurrection. There's an even more a uh, breathtaking quote from Benjamin Franklin that I don't use because I think it's irresponsible in the sense that Franklin felt very strongly that we should have impeachment because the alternative would be what happens when people rise up and do things they should not in a autocracy. Uh, it's been covered in other books, but I think in order to keep it calm, I think we need to say in all if we look at it honestly, regardless of what your political persuasion is, regardless of what you think the facts are in a particular case that need to be, need to be urged, uh, we need to look at what the criteria are. And it's not very popular to talk about these early cases. When, when Senator Blount, who I hesitate to go back to, but, but it's, it's important. When Senator Blount uh, decided to drive settlers to his, by the way, Blount was a signer of the Constitution. He bopped in to sign it so he could say he signed it, but he skipped everything to go to New York to advertise the sale of his Western lands. And Blount was a good example of a dangerous individual to the country. And the Senate took care of him in their own way and then decided in the ultimate setting, that having already kicked him out in the first trial, uh, that if he didn't have standing, senators, if, if, he did, if he did have standing, then senators can't be impeached. And from that, we arguably have the law, and I think it is the law now, uh, but you'll find people debating this one, House members and Senate members can't be impeached. Not subject to impeachment, because they are subject to being removed by their own uh, House, that is the House or the Senate, depending on who they are. But the exhibit outside has a wonderful story of Paul Ferguson and the impeachment that preceded his and the rationale behind it. And the rationale in going forward with the impeachment of Paul Ferguson 
and it's not the same law, it's a state law, and I'm not an expert on state impeachment law, but the exhibit outside is so superb because it teaches that the policy concept was Ferguson resigned before the Senate of the, before the Texas Senate could vote on his removal as governor. And yet they proceeded. And the rationale seems clear. They wanted to bar him from future office holding, and resignation would thwart that. So the, the, the concept of how hard the founding fathers struggled, uh, how these first impeachments, while the, while the framers were still alive, the people who wrote the Constitution that we call framers, that's, that's really important. It's, it's important we do it right. It's important we get the history right. We shouldn't let the politics of the day affect what's going to happen. We have to stay true to what history teaches, and we should stay true to precedent. And that's why you see this book quoting uh, the Federalist Society and Chief Justice Rehnquist, who wrote so much about impeachment. And uh, then you'll see me quoting Brennan. Uh, it, it is. It is a nonpartisan issue and ought to be and ought to remain. Uh, but I'll conclude and then take your questions because the House has the sole power to impeach in the Constitution, and the Senate has the sole power to try the case. And that's going to answer a whole lot of questions in the next year or so, six months, one week. Uh, it's, it's, it's important to understand that and that. These are our elected representatives, and if you like it, great, and if you don't like it, do something about it, and that's the final word of the book, which is, really, it's all about exercising your vote, your right to vote, because these are our representatives that are functioning. There's nothing revolutionary about it. It's the regular process, not the irregular process. They are not reversing an election. They're doing something, and you'll see a quote from a founder, uh, that was anticipated. They're doing something that was debated and put into the Constitution. So with that, let me take some questions and see how much I really can remember to keep my name straight on the first two impeachments. Steve. I had a couple. Um, do you think that the House is making a mistake by too narrowly drawing the future articles? And the second question was, um, do you think they should keep this impeachment open after the Senate as we all know will him uh, as expected? The first question is, uh, do I think they've made a mistake by narrowly drawing the impeachment articles? Um, I don't think they're narrowly drawn. I think they are brilliantly drawn. I think that Adam Schiff had a huge hand in this. He is the man who successfully prosecuted the last two impeachments in U.S. history. Porteous, the one I told you about, which was significantly investigated for years, and Kent, uh, Sam Kent, the federal judge uh, in Houston. So I think they're brilliantly drafted. I think that while they're narrow in scope of the fact allegations, they allege a pattern of conduct. And the pattern of conduct says that this president is renewing his prior patterns of conduct, including, and then they talk about and allude to the, a lot of prior fact information. So they understand there's no double jeopardy that applies to impeachment. They get it. They can re-impeach if they want, if they want. It's a political decision there. Uh, which leads me to your second question, which is, do you think they should hold the articles? Um, that'd be kind of presumptuous of me, because it's a political decision. It really is a political decision. From a can they do it, Absolutely. The Blount articles, here I'm going to go back into Blount again, you really, but the, the, uh, the Blount impeachment was really messed up. And Blount's articles were technically held for six months because they just voted. They just voted and they didn't get, the, get around to actually drafting the articles for six months. Meanwhile, Blount had absconded to his fancy home and never, and resisted, the way he resisted the subpoena was, when they came to get him, he just gave them drink and food and they all kind of went off into the sunset. So they can, the House can do what they want and the Senate can do what they want. It's a political question. 
about what is the politically right thing, good thing to do. But it's, a, it's not a civil trial, it's not a criminal trial, it is a congressional trial. Yes. You think that the framers were Madison would have had a different take on the Senate being the deliberative body had they initially had a direct election of senators rather than the appointments at that time? I don't know. I know they they debated it. Uh, Wilson would have a good answer for that because Wilson uh, Wilson really wanted more direct elections, and so they you know they talked about it. I, I think they just hoped that the system would stand up, and they prayed. They they really were great thinkers. So I, I I I'll, if it would be impertinent of me to step into Nancy Pelosi's shoes, I think it'd be pretty impertinent of me to step into uh, Madison's shoes. I know what Hamilton thought. Hamilton was a huge fan of the Senate as the deliberative body, and he just had faith. And let me say, in 1974, we had faith in that Senate, and the, that Senate was a deliberative body. So hard to change the Constitution as well. Um, so what you briefly referred to double jeopardy. So let me give you sort of a hypothetical, and let's say this random doesn't result in the removal of the president. We have an election. The balance of the Senate changes. The balance of the House stays substantially the same. Are you saying that even though President Trump might be, you know, is the correct word acquitted? Okay, it, the, the verbiage is if he is acquitted in the Senate, it is, it is considered an acquittal. Yes. So if he is acquitted in the Senate, we see 18 months from Yes, they could make the they could make the the Senate could make the same allegation the, the House could make the same allegations in a in the Senate they could they could have serial impeachments. You, you absolutely can have serial impeachments. Double jeopardy doesn't apply to impeachment. That also means that it is independent of going after the president on a crime. The president can either commit a crime beforehand and be impeached for it, or not commit a crime. And everybody can see he hasn't committed a crime and still be impeached for the same conduct. And that has happened in history. That has happened in history. Yes. My question is, um, it seems like we don't have that many impeachments overall, considering how many elected officials we have. Um, are we literally allowed to impeach people just for, I know this may sound great, but just general incompetence? I mean, there seem to be so many examples that we have to basically like execute the laws being part of the oath, right? And we have so many examples of um, elected officials being ignorant of their duties and accidentally due to a lack of knowledge or just general negligence failing to do their job. Is that by itself impeachable? Uh, the, answer, the short answer to the question of whether or not being incompetent and failing to do your job is that impeachable, absent serious, or what the current staff report in 2019 published last week says, absent grave harm, it is not. Absent grave harm. And the question is, misconduct akin to treason or bribery, or incapacity or negligence causing grave harm is impeachable. And the 1974 staff report emphasized that historically there are four categories generally of breaches of duty, in, uh, violating separations of power, all of those things. There's many serious things you can do, but the, that's not the key. The key is whether or not the country's being harmed. It's all about harm. Now, you will not see this on TV, I, I will say. This is You'll, talk, you'll hear people talking about grave, grave misconduct. Grave misconduct that causes no harm is arguably not impeachable unless in and of itself the grave misconduct is, is showing that we are at risk by virtue of it being repeated. And that is why Adam Schiff is pleading, or whoever's written the pleading, has written it in terms of a pattern of activity. And then you are preventing grave harm. But the ability to demonstrate enduring motives is not required. But it sure helps in demonstrating harm. 
And that is, I think, why that this particular set of pleadings in Trump, as opposed to the pleadings in Nixon, uh, emphasize the pattern of prior misconduct and anticipated future misconduct. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I know that Uh, the question is about what will happen. And I'm not going to predict. Uh, you have plenty of pundits more qualified than me that look at the polls and uh, are going to say what will happen. I, I, you know, you read the newspaper, you talk to the, you listen to the pundits. All the pundits say, well, actually, it's not just the pundits. You have the senators. You have the head. You have the majority leader of the Senate saying uh, it's not going to happen. So we can kind of get a sense from that, uh, but I'm not going to predict because this is really what's really good about this democracy. Uh, more evidence may come in. More evidence may come in. Uh, a lot depends on what the constituencies say. If there are, if the people of the United States who vote or affect these Congress people can't convince their senators, can't overcome whatever's going on, then we know what's going to happen. Uh, but I, I got to tell you, I've got great hope for the system that we've got in place. I, I worry that there's nobody speaking nationally that impeachment is a regular process. And by that, again, I mean regularized, not something we've decided to do every month. Yes, sir. Contempt of Congress. Um, are you talking in terms of discovery and, and uh, subpoenas, or are you talking about misbehavior, you know, during the process? Well, I recently had a, a judge uh, find uh, a defendant contempt of Congress for deposition of car accident, and the president is directing. It's a really good question about what about all these witnesses uh, who are, it's alleged, are being told not to appear uh, and that the source of that is alleged to be the president. Uh, the answer is the, the, the failure to or, or the impeding of the trial and the discovery process is clearly impeachable. Those were grounds back at Nixon time, and there are also grounds uh, in the Clinton impeachment in a different way. The Nixon impeachment combined obstruction or impeding Congress and the court and administration of justice. So it's impeachable, and it's a ground of the Trump impeachment. I mean, they've made it very clear. It does not have to be pled as obstruction. It's usually pled as three things, obstruction, impeding, and then whatever other verb, you know, uh, or article they want to they use. They try not to, in, they try to include something that doesn't require a mental state. Obstruction is sometimes considered a crime. Uh, that It's a term of art that is sometimes considered a crim, that you go to a criminal statute. So impeding is clearly impeachable. Uh, we learned that from the great research from the 1974 staff report. It was used against President Clinton by the very same people who are defending President Trump now. You probably all know now that Lindsey Graham was a, a prosecutor and urged, uh, urged strongly that uh, President Clinton should be liable in impeachment for his personal misconduct because of the harm it had caused. And the harm that it had caused had been undermining the faith of the nation in the process by a man who's the head of executive law enforcement. And so it did not matter that it was personal misconduct, and he cited 
federal judicial cases on point. Judge cases, impeachment cases involving judges who had lied, impeachment cases of judges who had committed tax fraud and bankruptcy fraud, all of which had diminished the integrity of the office and diminished the reputation to the degree that they were not effective in their offices and they were undermining the confidence of the country. And those were the bases for the Clinton impeachment, which this impeachment, the Trump impeachment, has chosen not to emphasize. They have not gone to the concept of you've committed one bad act, you have therefore reduced confidence in the presidency. They've gone for the broader, it is not a narrow pleading in my mind, they've gone for the broader way. The broader way is to say there's a pattern of misconduct and we think it will recur. And that solves your question about can it just be once? It can be if it's something like a self-pardon or a big abuse of the pardon power, Madison was clear. But it is better, the better, that's the way Porteous was tried. Porteous, Porteous was uh, pled in a very broad way. It was brilliantly done. Schiff really knows what he's doing. He's a prosecutor. And he has, no matter what others say, uh, you can see that the man has an idea for how this should be uh, pled. He may end up not being the manager. The House prosecutors are called managers. But you see Porteous and the concepts of Porteous impeachment all over this Trump impeachment. Brilliantly done. Yes, sir. The senators are absolutely jurors. They sit as judge and jury, and that answers your question about um, Judge Justice Roberts. He is supposed to be a figurehead. They can give him some power to rule, but he is absolutely a figurehead in impeachment. My reason for asking is the, the, the rule of law that I'll test the majority of the before they ever took it up in office, they couldn't sit as the jury. That's correct. In our, in our system, a jury, I'm just so for the record, it's, he's talking about uh, a juror in a, a regular case in our, in our judicial system, in our criminal and civil system. He, he, if, he, if he or she said, I can't be fair, I've already made up my mind, uh, if there, that he's out. But. Well, it's, it's unfortunate that they came out and said it, but it's also kind of truthful. You got to, uh, uh, the Senate has the sole power to try the case. They can't exclude the The House has the sole power to prosecute the case. So the House can say, we move to strike that juror. And then the Senate has the sole power to decide. Now, the Senate can delegate that authority to the to Justice Roberts or to whoever is supposed to. Only in a presidential case does the Chief Justice sit. Um, but when the Chief Justice sits, he is a figurehead. And if they delegate to him, as they have in rules in the past, certain ability to rule, the Senate can overrule him. The Senate sits as judge and jury. It ain't a civil trial. It's not a criminal trial. It's a congressional trial. Um, so you, history is the one that's going to judge this particular trial. History's going to judge this trial. Sir. Barbara, when Alcee Hastings was <clears throat> impeached and convicted, he returned to Miami and ran for Congress, where he still sits. When Porteous was impeached and convicted, the Senate added a provision, you are forbidden to run for any future federal office. What changed within that interim? Uh, actually, four have been, uh, four of the eight uh, impeachments, uh, of all the impeachments, have involved in conviction uh, barring future federal office holding. The request in Nixon, if memory serves, did not include a bar from future federal office holding. The, uh, the request in Clinton for the Clinton misconduct and the Clinton harm did rec in include that request. And so it's it's completely up to uh, however the House wants to plead. And so I, I don't think there's something special that happened along the way. I think that it depended on the minds and the hearts of the, of the prosecutors and what they felt would be most effective. 
I was surprised to see that, if my memory is right, that Nixon was, they did not ask for that future bar uh, well, of office holding. But the house. In, in LC Hastings? No. LC Hastings didn't have a bar. No. Sorry. In Cordius, it was the Senate that added the provision, you're for, forbidden to run for any future office. It wasn't the House. I thought it was done by motion. Uh, I don't know. What, why did they do it on Cordius but not Hastings? Well, Hastings was terrible misconduct. Uh, and so it's. Com <laughs> It, 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 Hastings was Hastings was was acquitted in his underlying trial. Hastings, who sits in the co in Congress still, Hastings um, was proven to have suborned perjury in the underlying trial, and that was proven not by a civil or criminal court. That was proven by a very uh, resourceful House who undertook to prove massive misconduct. And the massive misconduct, and it goes to your obstruction question as well, the massive misconduct included a cover-up. Literally, the, the most I've seen cover-up because his underlying crime they proved. They proved his underlying crime, and they proved that he lied to the grand jury and, and suborned perjury. And so the, the misconduct was proven as a pattern of behavior, and it is the pattern of behavior. Um, I think it might do, you find the ones that, where they lied to the FBI, those are the ones that people took uh, real seriously. Porteous lied to the FBI, and that evidence started to come out and started to come out. But I'd be speculating, do you have a theory? Because Ron Woods would have a theory. No, I don't. Oh, oh I, I greatly admire you being here. The Fifth Circuit to investigate Porteous and tried his case in front of the Fifth Circuit and then followed it up during the Judicial Commission over to the House, and I met with Schiff and explained to him the case, and it's my recall that the uh, acts are fairly well detailed in that it's not a broad, high crimes and misdemeanors. We allege each of his bankruptcy, fraud, his perjury, et cetera. It's all alleged in the article, and that's what they tried in front of the Senate. Uh, and it was it, it was beautifully developed. It took years to 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 put together, put all of it together. But the FBI investigation took a long time. Well, yeah. I worked for the FBI and I tried it in front of the Fifth Circuit. That's the way judicial impeachment starts in front of the circuits. Then it has to go to the Judicial Commission in the U.S. and they have to refer it to the House for impeachment. With all due respect. With all due respect, it doesn't have to be that way. It does under the new law. The Constitution would say that if any member of the House puts a, and by the way, only the House, only a House member can initiate impeachment, period. So if somebody in the House puts it in the hopper, then it is considered. Now, the House could say, no, the, the majority of the House could say, we're not going to do it. But as far as authority, I'm no expert in the details that you're talking about, but I do know that the only folks who can initiate it formally is the, as a House member. And if a House member wants to do it, even though there's no statutory authorization, even though he may have trouble getting evidence and he may anger the, the folks who are doing it in the proper procedural way, House member can do it. Well, the statute is that the circuits initiate the investigation. They appoint an independent prosecutor who works with the FBI. It's then tried in front of the circuit and then referred to the Judicial Commission for them to refer it to the House for impeachment. If the House were to initiate it, how are they going to investigate it? Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem. But the House, if they've got enough evidence, can charge if there's if there's public evidence they can use that so the house does what it can i'm not saying the house would do it but that they can they are not bound by any law they're literally not bound by any law statutory law or process in the fifth circuit 
It's entirely separate. The judicial system set up a statute and a process that's done through the circuits to remove federal judges. Of course, that doesn't apply to anybody else other than federal judges. With all due respect, I can't believe it. With all due respect, no. The, the judicial impeachments and presidential impeachments and secretaries of war who've been impeached and senators who've been, you know, the senator who was impeached that I got uh, water on me in the first part. The, it's all governed by high crimes and misdemeanors and it is the sole, let me go back to, you know the cover you've got here which talks about sole power of the house. This was chosen by the law librarian. Uh, sole power of the house. Sole power of the house. I understand they're the ones that they're the only ones that can initiate impeachment, but to get a federal judge to that point, the circuits are the ones under law that initiate the misbehavior the investigation of the misbehavior of the federal judge. Well we may be saying the same thing because the evidence should be gathered as best you can. And you do have a leg up when you don't have to worry about doing your own discovery. But there are, since it doesn't require a crime, and keep in mind, Porteous lied to the FBI, right? And so the lie alone to the FBI, that would be enough. No, he didn't lie to the FBI. He lied on his bankruptcy fraud and several other things. But, uh, but in his nomination process to be a federal judge, he, it was demonstrated that he repeatedly lied to the FBI and he induced witnesses to lie to the FBI. The, the, the girlfriend and the bail bondsman, or, this is the Porteous case, right? right. The, the, the bail bondsman, the girlfriend, all of the bribes on the state court bench, all, and he induced, the, the, he induced those people. It was just a massively corrupt item. And if the House had not gotten cooperation, let's say they really angered the Fifth Circuit by jumping the gun and they didn't go through the statutory process, the House could have subpoenaed those people. And they could have said, this guy's a crook. He's corrupt. And they would not have needed the cooperation. I'm not saying it would be the politic thing to do, but they absolutely could have done it. And the sole power of the House isn't just to charge it is the sole power of the House to handle all aspects of impeachment. This Walter Nixon v. U.S. case that's cited in my book is an amazing case authored by Rehnquist, who says when the Constitution and the framers uses the word sole, what it means is sole. It's literally a line from Rehnquist's order. This is in the sole power of the House. I told you about 20 minutes ago that at some point I'd say this. This is literally the sole power of the House to do. And it's very frustrating because nobody else can tell them what to do. They can try to persuade them. And it is in the sole power of the Senate to try the case as judge and jury. And that's extraordinary. Uh, and the, the Rehnquist majority opinion in Walter Nixon v. U.S. Is, is just powerful on that issue. And he had faith in the House and the Senate. He, he had The Kent impeachment um, was also w wonderfully handled by the House. Uh, they, they researched it very well, and along the way they were trying to get him to resign. That also involved uh, some Fifth Circuit activity. But Kent refused to resign. And in the course of the investigation, um, just he also, he just, he lied to the FBI. Kent, Kent's ultimate guilty plea was not to the underlying misconduct of sexual assault and uh, abuse of power to, to, to do all the bad things he did to the women who had the courage to step forward. Kent, ultimately, his criminal conviction was on obstruction of justice for lying to the FBI. And he refused to resign even as he sat in jail 
He did have these other conditional ones that were rejected. But he refused to resign because he did not want to give up his benefits and his big pay. He wanted to be Judge Kent in prison. And he was until, <laughs> until, <laughs> until Judge Kent became prisoner Kent, despite his lawyers and their protestations, because the House was so strong and they transferred it to the Senate and Harry Reid stood up and told the Houston Chronicle, who, by the way, should be lauded for their handling of the investigation, getting information where no one else could, getting witnesses to come forward, and then sticking a microphone in Harry Reid's face so Harry Reid said, the Senate stands ready to try the case. Whereupon, when they issued the summons to Kent in prison, they finally got his handwritten, I think it was handwritten, but at least it was a, a, a prepared letter of resignation. Only a Senate who stood ready to try the case brought about the resignation of that self-proclaimed Emperor of Galveston. That's, what who, that's who Sam Kent was. And for those of you friends with Sam Kent, my apologies, but goodness gracious. Yes, sir. One last question. Yeah. When you say that history will judge the current proceedings, yes. Uh, for those who aren't historians other than citing the uh, authority, uh -huh. can you explain what that means and different ways that could play out? Are you comfortable commenting on that? It's a great question. It's about you know what, what, what will, what do I mean by history will judge? Um, I don't know if anybody's a Barbara Tuchman fan, the great historian who, who refused in time to judge, uh, when she, judge history, w which was within 50 years of her. Um, and she wrote eloquently on that, and yet she was a great historian. And so I've always felt that the way historians are apparently trained, uh, especially United States historians, uh, but Great Britain too, uh, is that you can't be objective about what's happening now. Not only is it happening to us, we, the people, uh, but it's also, it's also hard to get a perspective. More evidence will come out. The evidence will out. We'll know. Um, and yet, uh, I, I don't know if in the next 20 years or 50 years we really will know, but 100 years from now, people will have, and historians who are objective, who are looking at that not not living through it, historians will look back, and it is why, uh, it is why, folks, books are so important. I mean, let me just conclude with that. The historians who write history, uh, the ones who are there for the ages, it's not just our current great historians like Wilson, Edmund Wilson and those, but I mean, if, if we didn't have, if, if we didn't have Homer, writing things down or at least telling stories and having them then written down, we wouldn't know about a bunch of wars that happened. We wouldn't know about what civilization was like a long time ago. And so I, I do have great hope that in a hundred years, and clearly in a thousand years, um, this will be put into perspective. And I also am a big believer in the American ideal and in this experiment. And the founders predicted this. You know, I started off by telling you about Madison. Madison said there will be corrupt people. There will be incapacitated people. We can't just have a constitution that doesn't have impeachment. And so I can't tell you what they're going to say in 100 years. It, it, won't be, you know, it, it won't be the max boots of our time because he's already injected himself so much. It won't be me because I'll be dead. But some of our grandchildren or great-grandchildren are going to be great historians, and they're going to analyze this. They're going to have things released, and they will say, here's what happened in the 20th impeachment in U.S. history. And it'll be somebody's, it won't be a 100-page book, you know, it'll be maybe a 1,000-page book, but it'll be, it'll say, it'll say what happened. And we'll have a, we'll, it'll be okay. It's, it's hard now. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, I don't want to cut the conversation off. I just want to move it into the next yeah. room where Barbara has graciously agreed to sign copies yeah. of her books yep. if you have those. 
Um, additionally, the law library has put together an exhibit. So these are the impeachments that happened 100 years ago, as Barbara yeah. was talking about, the books that everyone wrote down. It's so a great exhibit. If you want to learn about uh, Governor Ferguson or, or other Texas impeachments, um, we have a great exhibit for you to look at as you're waiting in the book signing line. So thank you, Barbara, and thank you all for coming today. This video is accredited by the State Bar of Texas from February 1st, 2020 through January 31st, 2021. Report CLE credit at www.texasbar.com using course number 1740772220. Texas CLE credit is provided by the Office of Vince Ryan, Harris County Attorney.